everybody in this world has got, well, not everybody, but pretty well everyone's different. They've all got a different DNA. I think the odds of having the same DNA are 14 million to one. Actually, exactly the same as the number of telephone lines there are in this country as well. And actually, exactly the same odds as winning the National Lottery. It's the same as having the same DNA. There you go. Put that in your Christmas cracker. <laughs> so we all deal with things differently and we're all different and people have different approaches and different ways and different thoughts in their head, different circumstances. Everybody in the world is absolutely better than anybody else at something. The sadness is most of them don't find out what it is because they don't get the opportunity. But nature says that they must be better at something than everyone else because they're different. When you get into a situation in, in life and you're on some sort of progression, you have to make a lot of decisions. And sometimes they'll come at you from really bizarre angles, you know. And you can mix a lot of these rules, by the way, together. I'll, t I'll tell you a little story. So I'm doing my conkers in 1989. For those of you who don't understand what your conkers is, it's not a good time. I'm losing millions of pounds. I owe the bank millions of pounds. And like a fighter coming out for the later championship rounds, I'm getting close to having enough. I learned more during this period, by the way, than I learned the whole of my life. I never shared that time with anybody, wives, family, anything. It wasn't their job to know. It was my job to fix. And I had an event starting. It was the European Snooker League. I think it was starting in January 89. And Christmas Eve, 1988, I had one last pitch. I needed a sponsor for £300,000. And I didn't have one. And I was losing so much money. This was like, for the first time, I actually thought, I'm a chartered accountant, I can always get a job. So I wasn't going to starve, I wasn't going to be in trouble, but... The dreams of what I was thinking of uh, my life was going to be clearly wasn't happening. I got off at Slough Station to see Trust House 40. The managing director there was a guy called Alan Hearn. No relation, but interesting, same surname. Four o'clock, I got off the train at Slough and it started to snow. It was like a Dickens novel. Walked into it, my heart wasn't in it at all. Got in to see Mr Hearn. He said, what have you got for me? I said, I've... And I started the sales pitch, which I'm generally quite good at, but this was awful. My heart, it was, it was I'd had too much of a battering. I'd lost too many deals. Uh, finished it in 20 minutes. Quite honestly, I was an embarrassment to be there. Not professional at all. And he looked at me and he said, it's Christmas Eve. It's 4.30 Christmas Eve. I went, I know. He said, you must really need this. And I said, tell the truth. I said, I do. Mm. I really need this. And he said, well, I've got no money. And that was like someone kicked me straight in the lower regions. I thought, well, that's it. I can't do more than I've done. I've given it the best shot. I've had two years of absolutely nightmares. And I've shouldered it on my own. Probably a mistake. So I just thought, well, I'll go out with some class. And I said, well, Mr. Hearn, Thank you very much for seeing me. I appreciate it's Christmas Eve. Let me wish you and your family a happy new year. I turned around to walk out the door and he said, but I've got hotel rooms. I said, what does that mean? He said, well, I've got no money. I said, no, I understood that bit. <laughs> he said, but I've got hotel rooms, he said. And at that time, Trust House 40 had Sandy Lane in Barbados, Plaza Athena in Paris, Waldorf in London. They're great hotels. He said, I will give you £300,000 of hotel rooms but no money for this sponsorship. And we shook hands. I left. By the time I got walked back to Slough Station, I'd sold the lot to mates of mine in the travel business at a 40% discount for cash. I got 180 grand. That 180 grand saved my life, saved my business, and saved me, more importantly, show me that you're never completely finished. You know, while you're breathing, there's fighting the old dog. That was a 12th round knockout for me in my really? world. But it taught me lots of things. It taught me that when you're in situations like that, the situation will define you as a person as well as you will define the situation. And you learn more about yourself in adversity 
than you'll ever learn in success. And what did you learn about yourself that surprised you? I've got some nuts, mate. I've got, I'm unbeatable. I'm totally and completely, unequivocally unbeatable. But you didn't know that before, right? No. I didn't know how unbeatable because I had never been beaten that badly. It's like a fighter. Just look at it as a fight. There's plenty of times you go in the ring, you fancy the job. You're unbeatable. Yeah, yeah. It's all in the head. Other times you go in the ring and think, this geezer's too good for me. You've lost before you start. Yeah. It's in the head. But over a period of time, you learn a little bit more about yourself because you have more experience in different circumstances. Then you find out what you really are. I found out I'm unbeatable. I can't be beat. This is impossible. You can dent me. You can damage me. You're never, ever going to beat me. I'm too happy to. I'm too happy not to exist. <laughs> Go on, tell us what well, that means. Well, that actually takes us nicely onto on. rule number seven, doesn't it? Life ends in tears. Yeah. So sums smile it, well, for the rest of your life. Just sums it all up. You know, my father never taught me anything because he was, you know, he wasn't a, an active father. Yeah. But what he did say was, "Don't waste a minute, son." Yeah. Don't waste a minute. But everyone knows it, this. Everyone knows this already, but we all walk around obsessed with the tiny little things that get us down or frustrate us or missing a bus. Or, you've managed yeah. to get rid of those things. Like, how have you done that? Well, I, again, I think you just compartmentalise compartmentalise your brain into such what's important. What is important in your life? You know, you could make a list, couldn't you? Most important in your life, family, without a doubt. That's, don't want to plug my book, but bi business a close second is what it says on the back yeah. page. And that's exactly what it is. Everyone knows. But when it comes to Sunday lunch around my house, you talk dinner, my wife will pick up your plate and give it to the dog. <laughs> End of story. No one disagrees. The woman's in control. You know, she's in charge. She's the matriarch of the family. And that's how it should be. Because well, I've, I've been used to that succession of time. When my grandfather retired at 65, I remember him saying about a month before he retired to my grandmother, Gladys, I don't know what we're going to do when we retire. Because my pension is only going to be three or four quid a month or week or whatever. How are we going to survive? She said, well, we've always got our savings, Will. And he looked at her. I'll never forget his face. Savings? What are you talking about, savings? She said, well, I've always put a few pounds away. Have you? He had no idea. Been married 45 years. He had no idea. He said, how much have we got? She said, a little over £6,000. He nearly had a heart attack. <laughs> Six. Thousand pound. I mean, that, that was enough to buy a little bungalow, by the way, when yeah, he retired yeah. in Shubri Ness and some change. But it was like he had mm. absolutely zero idea. So, you know, just go through your life. I mean, it's terribly easy to say. And look, people are out there suffering. We're in a recession. There's going to, the gap between the haves and the have nots is widening every day. We've got to do something. We've got to do a lot about it because this country is unique and without getting too deep, we don't look unique enough for me. But somehow or the other, you've got to try and push that to one side because we're, we're going through the motions of waiting to die. So deal with it. And you do know, I think life begins with smiles and ends with tears, doesn't it? Mm. But that's that's what's going to be. That's one thing you can't change. So there's no point. In, when you can't affect anything, don't give it a moment's thought because that moment is a wasted thought and you could be thinking about something else. And as you get older, you're now 74. Mm. Are you more aware of your mortality? Do yeah. You, oh, do you all sort the time. of fear the end or not? I spend most of my time planning how I can get around inheritance tax. I hate it. <laughs> You know, 40% of government. That's Jesus a very practical Christ. way of looking at it. 40% you've already paid tax on, by the way. I know, I know. Don't tell me, don't tell me. It's absolutely disgraceful. But then I start thinking about, there's other things we can do. I think there's three stages. Actually, there's five stages in life, but really three for most people. Number one is the selfish stage, when you're fighting to get out of wherever you are, fighting to achieve you. Whatever you're doing, you can be a rich kid. You're still going to be selfish. You don't, just Poor doesn't change anything mm. it's an attitude perhaps you're not a nicest husband perhaps you're not the nicest father you're so determined to succeed you've got to run over people to get there yep. there'll be casualties then you get to a certain stage where you think I'm getting there 
inside you start to relax, your metabolism slows down a little bit. Now I used to have a terrible temper when I was younger. I, that, that's gone. It's gone. I smile at everyone now. What smile age pills did that go? Oh, 73. <laughs> <laughs> no, there are times, but no. But what I'm saying is that's the selfish. So the next one is that when you can be a decent father, decent husband and a better person and you're into the, the swing of business and life and you're mature a little bit and then you, you become a little bit nicer. The third stage is where you say, well, that's all taken care of now. So I can look at my community or where I come from and perhaps do a little bit of good to that. It does go to number four. We can say, I can look at my country and say, how can I do well for the country? And number five is, how can I do well for the world? But unless you're Jeff Bezos or Bill Gates or Warren Buffett, very rarely do we get to number five. I don't suppose I'll have a dramatic effect on the world, but I can have an effect on where I came from and the community I work in. And that is actually another target as for later in life. Because the great thing about making money and being successful is the race is over when you've done that. There isn't a chapter on what to do with it. So you might as well do some good with it. Just a quick one to say thank you so much for watching this content on the High Performance channel. We would love it if you would subscribe. You know, most people that watch what we do don't subscribe. If you can subscribe, we can make this bigger, better, bolder than we've ever done before. So hit subscribe right now and help the High Performance podcast make a real difference to the world. See you soon.